Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Susan Toll. Uh, Susan attended Oregon Health and Science University for Medical School, uh, completed her internal medicine residency at UC San Diego, where she was chief resident. Uh, Susan then completed the McLean Fellowship in 1988-89, uh, after which um, she went on to found um, the Oregon Health and Science University Center's uh, ethics program called Ethics in Health Care, uh, which she has directed since 1989. Um, Susan was the youngest person ever appointed as a professor at the Oregon Health and Sciences University. In 2014, uh, Susan received the McLean Center Prize for her outstanding work in developing and nurturing the POST system, a system which has now been adopted by 44 legislatures in the United States, and for improving end-of-life care throughout the country. Uh, today, um, doc Dr. Susan Toll uh, will talk on the following topic, transforming end-of-life care, it takes more than a pulsed form. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Toll. The first thing is, who's having the conversation? We now have a form in our registry. And uh, some have forms and it's not in the registry. But we're able to look back and see who is signing pulse forms. And we look to see who is signing pulse forms for patients whose death certificate indicates that their cause of death, primary cause of death was cancer. How often do you think it's the oncologist? Very close. So we looked at over 6,000 pulse forms, and, um, and about half of patients with cancer have one, and it's 15%. Um, primary care is carrying much of the freight here, and um, we don't know, of course, how much oncologists may have talked to people. This follows Gretchen's talk perfectly about what is being said and shared and what people are saying to one another, but the actual signature and the process of completing and submitting the forms is heavily done by primary care. Now I'd like to shift to the study that I was fortunate to have a very skilled and courageous colleague, Joan Tinnell, partner with me in writing. Um, to look at the overall care of patients over a 13-year period of time near the end of life in Oregon, Washington, and the rest of the country. And to look at a question of the fact that the most of the time people say they'd rather be at home than in an acute care hospital, an intensive care unit, that near the end of life, that is a very broad preference. It varies a little bit by certain kinds of demographics, but not a lot, and it's a majority in every group that's been studied. Most studies put the rate at about 90% of people saying, I would prefer something when this. There we go. So you see things that I don't see. It's very interesting. Um, but this is dying at home. So we took 800,000 fee-for-service Medicare enrollees, and we looked at the year 2000, the year 2005, and the year 2013. We looked at Oregon, we looked at Washington, which demographically is not like us uh, in many different ways. And they have had a pulse program since 2000. They um, vote in a similar way. There are many things about them as geographically close to us. But yet, quite a 
much lower rate of that home. Home, by our definition, is not a skilled nursing facility, not an inpatient hospice, and not a hospital. So if you live in assisted living, that is your home, and would be time as well. So you can see that Oregon is much higher and still rising uh, for death at home, which most people say they want. We also where people do not, um, if in Oregon you end up hospitalized near the end of life, you are far more likely to go back home rather than to a facility. Home hospice is used at a much higher rate. It's part of how you die at home because there's somebody to call, there's a plan, there's a backup. You can get it where you need. <coughs> and ICU in the last 30 days of life is rising all across the country. Um, as we know more ICU beds, we use them. But it's lower in Oregon and rising at a little bit lower here. This is about a lot more than the pulse form. This is about all kinds of interventions at all kinds of levels. We don't know which intervention has the most impact, is the most important, how the interventions relate to each other. But interventions have been made in individualized education uh, for patients as well as for healthcare professionals broadly. We have had over 200 uh, statewide and regional conferences um, to do some broad outreach. We've developed materials that can be shown in offices, booklets, brochures, short videos. Um, so that's at the individual level. We, at the state level, created a statewide registry so things can be found very quickly. Next month, we will be pumping out of the registry to every emergency department. The minute a patient registers and has a pulse form, the form will actually go to the emergency department in the statewide system called EMIT, which is the Emergency Department Information Exchange. So those are kind of government, state, uh, level. At the more grassroots system level, we have very minimal hospice. They are fully responsive, um, and in general, patients on a Friday morning who have a stroke and now are eligible for hospice and last week weren't, we can usually get them enrolled before the weekend. This means, of course, that hospice is not paying more overtime not uh, always the most economically advantageous to the hospice program. <coughs> we have done a lot of things with the electronic uh, registry. Uh, we have what's called bi-directional. So on the patient header, it says pulse yes, no, and automatically fed from the registry is not just what's in our epic record system, but anything in the registry pops up as yes. Um, and there's a lot of pressure and work to figure out how the time of these conversations can be honored, a lot more work to be done there. Clearly local champions matter, um, efforts to make change, bring about change in your individual health systems. There is an ongoing need for quality insurance. Our biggest problem is a little pulse is good, a lot must be better, and we're seeing pulse pumps completed in people who are too healthy. Uh, and there are some challenges and some concerns. <coughs> Welcome to Medicare. Some people are carrying it out on all 65-year-olds as part of that process. Easier to count both forms and try to get the advanced directives turned in. So there are some quality things that need constant monitoring. I am concerned about the public trust that clearly our economic systems are changing. It used to be in fee-for-service, the more you did, the more 
already made. Now, obviously, as we have more moved coordinated care organizations, that incentive has flipped. Um, and as we do more and more pressure to encourage the completion of pulse forms in people who are too healthy, um, the public trust is at risk. And especially if we look at issues related to conflict of interest and policies and procedures who is funding any kind of incentive or encouragement to complete pulse forms, perhaps counting them as a quality measure, those kinds of things can be deeply concerning. We have since been so concerned about this issue in Oregon, which does not accept health care industry support for the pulse program, that we have actually withdrawn from the national pulse paradigm because the philosophy is different on this issue. And I'm deeply concerned where this may take us with regard to the public trust. All of these things that I've shared and some of the background materials are available on our website. And um, there's lots more that uh, time does not permit. It is such an honor and privilege. We do not have accomplished the kind of benefits without your fellowship and our Thank you, Mark. Thank you to everyone who has partnered with me, encouraged, facilitated, and a special remembrance. Dr. Toll, thank you so much. Um, I have to admit, when you said you pulled out of the national pulsed paradigm, my jaw dropped and I felt a knot in my stomach. You are pulsed. Uh, tell, could you tell us more about what your differences are with them? Susan, that was phenomenal, and I just I marvel at how much of a force of nature you are. I mean, this is just extraordinary work that you've done. It's really impressive. I'm wondering if you could talk just a little bit about some special populations and pulsed forms, particularly given that there's some rules around hospice. So there's some people who I might imagine who would want a pulsed form, but actually don't have access to hospice. One example is patients with end-stage renal disease who would have to stop doing dialysis in order to receive hospice. So how does PULSED work for them, and does that allow them to get access to home care at the end of life instead of having to go to the hospital? They want. 
Anderson just gave a talk, should we be dialyzing grandma uh, as a grand round? So we're engaged. Yeah, great. Susan, thank you.